Thank you for coming and uh, hopefully we can tell you a little bit about the honeybees and what's happening to the honeybees and take you inside a beehive and what actually goes, in, goes on in this little mini world of the uh, beehive. But before I start, let me just share a little bit about myself uh, a little further. I'll just take uh, three or four minutes. But I grew up with beekeeping. My uh, father came from Poland uh, in uh, 1947 as a beekeeper, and he taught me everything he knew. But before him, we go back six generations, all the way back to Poland in northern Poland in uh, the 1840s. We traced it back. Could be even further. But I grew up from a little lad and uh, right up the ranks, and I've been beekeeping all my life. And I, I went to school, became a teacher. 38 years, I taught at Northbridge High School and kept bees 100, between 100 and 150 hives throughout my whole life with my dad. And when he passed away, I then took it upon myself to keep the 125 hives. And I've been doing that since I retired about uh, a few years back. I retired from 38 years of teaching and, and increased my number of hives uh, a little bit. And I just retired. I was supposed to go on a, a trip and do some travel with my wife. And I get a call from Dr. Lou at Harvard University. And he calls me up and says, Ken, he says, this is Dr. Lou at Harvard University. Uh, we'd like you to come and work for Harvard. We're going to be doing a five-year study on why the honeybees are dying. I said, is this the Harvard in Cambridge? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, well, let me tell you, Dr. Lou, the closest I got to uh, getting into Harvard is when I saw the outside walls of the courtyard looking in from Harvard Square. And, and you want me to come work for Harvard? And he said, yeah. I says, I was supposed to do some travel with my wife. And he says, Ken, this is for the bees. <laughs> I said, so I said, let me get back to you. Oh, I, I can convince you now. And so I took upon this five-year study with 60 hives. And so I got to figure out, how do I break it into my wife and tell her? Well, no more than two weeks later, I got the call from Dr. Jeff Pettis, the head of the Beltsville Bee Lab in Beltsville, Maryland, which is the top scientist on honeybees in the country. And he says, Ken, they discovered Asian longhorn beetle uh, in Central Mass a dangerous beetle that infects the trees and kills off the maple trees. And he says, we're going to do a study with 80 hives, and we want you to direct the study up there. We understand you're the best there is in beekeeping. And I said to him, I said, Jeff, I says, I was supposed to travel with my wife. I just took on a, a study with Harvard University and Dr. Lou uh, uh, for five years. And I haven't even broken into my wife. He says, Ken, this is for your country. And so here I am. Dr. Lou got me. And I said, well, OK, I guess, all right, let me tentatively say yes. So now I'm trying to figure out how am I going to break into my wife when I'm going to do some traveling for a while. And so one night I sit down. I said, Deb, sit down. Have a seat here. Uh, want a cup of tea and honey? And said, what's wrong? What's wrong? I says, well, you know how we're supposed to travel and do a little traveling now that I'm retired? She said, she said yeah, when are we leaving? I says, well, we're going to have to postpone it. I said, why? How, for how long? I said, probably five years. And she said, what's, I'm taking on two studies on honeybees and why they're dying. And so I, she said, no, no, I know your love for honeybees. She says, go ahead do both studies, said we can always travel after. And so here we are, close to the end of the uh, two studies. And so pretty soon, I'll be able to honor her wishes and, and do some uh, traveling here. But meantime, I took on, you know, I was up to here after 38 years with students. Now I'm up to here with honeybees. And like I said, I don't know which is worse. One talks back, one stings. So I guess it's take your choice. So anyway, that's how I get involved. I, you know, I grew up with the honeybees. I took on these two studies. I've always been a member of the Worcester County Beekeepers, and, and I speak all around New England to bee groups and, uh, and libraries, 137 libraries over the past two years that I've spoken to on honeybees and what's going on. And so tonight I'm here basically to let people know 
about honeybees, what's going on, a little bit about the hobby of beekeeping and what it involves and how to get started, and finally, let you taste, realize honey is not honey is not honey. Honey comes in various flavors, tastes, colors, and hopefully you'll be able to enjoy uh, some of those flavors back there if you haven't already. So we're going to talk a little bit about honeybees in that sense. And over the past, I started beekeeping in the 50s, the challenges that we have now weren't there. Today the bees are dying at alarming rates. 50% here in Massachusetts during this past year. 45% last year. 40% the year before. Of the honeybees are dying and we're trying to figure out why. One of the reasons I took on the Harvard and the USDA studies, we're trying to experiment to find out what's happening to the honeybees. And just to, what's different from the 1950s to now that's bringing about these losses. And those aren't sustainable losses for long. By 2040, if we don't get this straightened out, we could be facing a world without the honeybees. And so there's research going on all over, not only Harvard and USDA, Cornell, Penn State, you name it, they're looking for the answers because it's to save 40% of all foods worldwide. And that's this crisis isn't just the United States, it's a worldwide crisis. In China, where Dr. Liu comes from, in the northern quadrant, there are no honeybees. They hand pollinate apple trees by hand. It takes one person seven hours to do a full big apple tree, going bloom to bloom with brushes. The honeybees can do it in seven minutes. And so you can see these large crops like the almonds, like the cranberries, we need the honeybees for our food source. And if we don't have them, yeah, you got bumblebees, you got, which are also being affected. You have solitary bees that do some pollinating. But with bumblebees, they come in hives of 80,000. The bumblebees come in a nest of 150. So when you've got thousands of acres of cranberries, 125 bees isn't going to be able to get that large number. But you bring in hives and hives with 80,000 honeybees, they're going to cover those cranberries and pollinate them well. So they get your beautiful apples, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, peaches, plums, uh, cucumbers, melons, squash, everything that we eat, 40%. Fiber crops like cotton, it, they're vital. So why I took on a study is not so much for money, it's to help the honeybees. I love the honeybees, I've grown up with them, and it, it's a love I have, it's, it's a love affair with the honeybees. And, nature and so that's why I'm here to speak to the public let them know a little bit about what's going on uh, with the honeybees you know of course things have changed in the in the 80s late 80s early 90s a little mite came into the United States this little tick like you can shake this after take a look they get on the honeybees suck the blood out of them and as they puncture the honeybees to suck their blood the hemolith what happens is they vector viruses. And so along with the viruses that were always there, but never to the degree we, had, we see it in the honeybees today. And then the other thing, the new set of pesticides called neonicotinoids, systemic pesticides, weakening the immune system of the honeybee with these mites vectoring and bringing on the viruses. And then monoculture, where the bees now you know, they travel around, go on two or three different crops. Just like us, we need a wide, balanced diet of a little bit of everything to keep healthy. The honeybees aren't getting that. And not only that, but years ago, you know, all these open fields, meadows, now there's housing developments, and people with these $10,000 lawns, I call them. Not a dandelion, not a chickweed, not a, uh, uh, you know, flower in there. It's like a rug. And so as a result, I said, this is all affecting the honeybees. And I hope we can find the answer because I don't want to see the honeybees disappear in my lifetime and not even for my uh, children's lifetime because they're essential and they're a beautiful insect. We're going to see here how the honeybee lives. And if we could only model the honeybee's behavior, we'd be a better society. I'll tell you that. I've studied the honeybees in their little mini world getting out there, and the good thing about all this losses in the honeybees that 
people are getting into the hobby to help the honeybees, but they're finding how beautiful this hobby is, how special. You know, I had a psychiatrist come out from UMass with me and uh, spent a day with me with my bees, and oh my God, she said, Ken, this is so rewarding. I came out here, I forgot all about my problems. I got so engrossed in going into the hive, I said, look, look at the bees, what they're doing here. And she, she got totally engrossed. End of the day, she, had a, she said, I, I'm usually so stressed, I'm so relaxed. And she said, now there's four psychiatrists at UMass keeping honeybees. You know, it, it's really catchy. And at, at Worcester County Bee School, we had 400 people, a record number, the past two or three years that are getting into beekeeping. 400 at our bee school, Grafton High School last year. I think it might be the biggest bee school in the country at the Worcester County Beekeepers School. Just incredible how people are getting into this, which is a good thing. And at the end, I'll talk about what can the general public do to really help beekeeping. So as we get into this and this tour through a beehive, look at it as little human beings in that beehive and how they all work together for the good of all. Okay, so if we could put the lights on out here and uh, we'll start here. The first slide is, I've been beekeeping for a long, long time. I don't even want to tell you. You can see the white hair uh, and it's been for a long, long time. Here you can see me at the parting of the seas with Moses. <laughs> you can see the bee veil at my foot there. After that event was over, I was heading over to the Nile to work with my hives uh, on the Nile River. And of course, the pharaohs would take all the honey for making mead and for uh, eating for themselves. So uh, I've been at it a long, long time. But in our reality, you can see me here as a five-year-old. There's my first beehive. I was so excited. I was so excited. My dad, on my fifth birthday, gave me a beehive. He said, you're going to take care of it yourself. I'll help lift the supers and the boxes, but you're going to tell me what you want done, and you're going to manage. I felt like a million bucks. I can remember that day when he took me out there and said, happy birthday. This is your beehive. i never forget that all my whole life. I still remember that moment. It was very special to me. And I'll just share a quick story here. I don't want to take too much time, but my dad said, we're going to have a little contest. Whoever's hive gets more honey, they're going to take the other one out to eat to a restaurant. And those are the days you went to a restaurant once a year, maybe twice a year. So going to a restaurant was a big thing. And I, I had in my mind, you know, maybe I can win this. And, and you know, so went through the season. That August, August 30th, we took off his honey first, weighed it up. He had 76 pounds. We went into the honey house, took my honey in. I had 84 pounds. I won, I forgot, I ran. Ma, Ma, I won, I had more honey. My dad says, I don't know how you did this. You're a great beekeeper. You know, he hooked me right then and there. You're a great beekeeper, I, don't, I can't believe it. And so we went down to the bungalow at the foot of the hill, the bungalow restaurant where Mr. Odette was the chef, the dishwasher, and the, and the waiter. And I took steak. I remember I, the other kids in the family, the other five, said, why is he go to get out to eat? Well, he into the beekeeping with dad. He wanted to, so it was a, a contest. So I went down with my dad, and we're talking about the bees, special, the whole, during the meal, and, and it hooked me for life. Here I am, all these years later, still beekeeping. But it was a, a, a great, great uh, uh, moment, and what's broke that whole moment away. A couple years back, my mom was not doing well. She said, I'm gonna tell you a secret, Ken. Your dad would kill me now if he was still alive. She says, you know, my dad, your dad told me he gave you his best hive so you could win. And I said, thanks, Ma. And, and you know, but I kind of figured, I figured something because we won. So anyway, I've been at it a long, long time here. But that's what it looks like when you go into a beehive. 80,000 honeybees looking up at you with those little brown eyes. Looking up and you can imagine them envisioning a giant. And yet, 
if you're not hurting them, they're so kind and they're so gentle. Honeybees, the European honeybees. And you can work with them for an hour without the veil I wear, t-shirt. You ask beekeepers out there, they, they call me the bee whisperer. I talk to them, I gently touch them. The tender, loving care, they love it. And anybody that's been out there with me knows I handle bees in a special way. And don't get stung or rarely get stung. They do sting, they have a stinger, but they die when they sting. So they're sacrificing their life for the good of the colony. If I were to start squeezing, killing bees, guess what, they'd come after me. And you don't blame them. You know, so as a result here, just like you protect your kids, they, they protect themselves. So that's what the colony looks like. And all these bees just doing their own thing and know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And nobody has to teach them. It's all instinctive. And I'm just going to show you this. Here in January, in the north, northern latitudes, a colony may only have six or 7,000 bees. They die off over the winter. And then starting in the middle of January, the queen starts laying eggs. Thousands of eggs that hatch into adult bees and starts building up the numbers. So you can see by the middle of May, the beginning of May, the colony is at its peak strength. Well, up here in the Northeast, what else is at peak strength? All the flowers are coming into bloom. The apples, the strawberries, the blueberries, the peaches. You know, all, it's like a mesh. Over millions of years, it was a love affair between the flowers and the bees. I want to read you the most beautiful passage I've ever found on honeybees. It's about the love affair between the honeybee and the flower. Man wasn't included here. Go to your fields and your gardens. And you shall learn that it is the pleasure of the bees to gather the honey of the flower. But it is also the pleasure of the flower to yield its honey to the bee. For to the bee, a flower is a fountain of life. And to the flower, a bee is a messenger of love. And to both the bee and the flower, the giving and receiving of pleasure is a need and an ecstasy. Be it in your pleasure like the flowers and the bees. So what's it saying? They didn't need man. But now there's a third cog in that combination is man. Because to save the bees, it's got to be our help. The wild bees are dying. They're not there anymore. The feral colonies are dead. I used to know hundreds of bee trees. They're, they're no longer. It takes man to take care of the bees. So it's a three-way love affair between man, bees, and flowers. And we got to help in nature, whereas for millions of years, the bees and the flowers could do it alone. Isn't that sad? But that's the way it is. So what happens is that meshing, the perfect match. The flowers need to be pollinated. The bees need the nectar and the pollen to survive. It's the perfect match in nature for survival of both. And for man, really, because think, we lose the honeybee and no pollination, no food. So it's a need and an ecstasy. And this is the playground of the honeybee. Fields where they have all kinds of flowers so they can get pollen and nectar and have a balanced diet. They use that pollen as a high protein food to feed their babies. They eat the nectar, make it into honey, which they eat themselves the carbohydrates for energy to make heat in the hive because they have to keep it at 93 degrees. Whenever they're rearing young babies, young brood, they have to keep it at 93. Isn't that an amazing thing? 20 below zero there we had a couple of days this past winter. With the USDA study, I got these $3,000 scales with sensors all over. I had the sensors into the cluster of bees. You know what it was? January 29th, it was 93 degrees. Amazing, and it was like 20 below. How, how they can do that? I said to my wife, let's put 10 swarms of bees in our attic and just heat with the bees. Why pay oil, you know? And we have a hard time turning it to 68 and keeping it at 68. And they can keep it at 93 to hatch out the brood. Just an amazing, to me, a phenomenon. I see that. I can feel the heat. I go in winter sometimes just to check them quickly. I put my hand there, and there's tremendous heat. Come, 93. 
That's, I'd like to have everybody experience that. Open up on a 20 below zero day and just feel the heat coming and they're surviving. They're surviving. So, yes. Lots of what? Queen? Yeah. So what well, if you, that's uh, when I talk to beekeepers. If you lose your queen, the colony, we'll talk about that here in a minute. We're getting back to that. No, I didn't, I'm going to come across that. But they go and gather nectar and pollen from all the fields three miles away. They go in a circle three miles to get that. They just fly back and forth. In the, in the summertime, start at 4.30 in the morning till 9 in the evening. They come in and the last of the bees come in. They work themselves, they only live six weeks. They sacrifice for the good of the colony so they can build up surplus for the winter months up here in the northern latitudes. They sacrifice, they're not, not jealous. And, and here you can see, they just go out, they got this long tongue, and it's so interesting to see, they stick it down in, suck up this sweet nectar, and bring it back to the hive and collect pollen. And you can see there's three types of bees in the hive. On the far right here is the, this, we got some great pictures my friend took, but on the far right, that's the worker bee. That's the smallest one. And those are all females. They do all the work in the hive. The females, called the worker bees, they do all the work. The, the males do nothing. I often said to my wife, what happened over the course of nature in millions of years? Why isn't it that way with the human race? She said, yeah, right. I says, I, I says, well, the female, it's a female matriarchal society. And she says, she says, yeah, well, it's a good thing it's changed. So anyway, they do all the work. In the middle is the drone. The drone is the male. There's only about 4% males in the whole hive. They're there for one purpose, to mate with a new queen and make sure that she gets mated well so that she can come back to the hive and lay a lot of eggs that are fertilized that make worker bees. Because you don't want a lot of boy bees in the hive, because what happens? They strut around, do nothing. They just eat the honey and wait for the new queen and mate with her. 15 or, 15 or so males will mate with the queen, and she comes back to the hive and mate it for life. And then the queen, by the way, the sad part with the boys, in the fall, about October, just about in another month, the females throw all the drones out of the hive for the winter. You didn't work. You're not going to eat and waste our stores all winter. We don't need you. In the winter months, you see them dragging out the males. The males are fighting back, but the worker bees outnumber them. They're in, you see them in the grass on a cold October evening. And I say to my wife, look at them sad. Look at them in the cold trying to get into warmth, and they won't let them in. She said, that's the way it should be in human society. You know, she gets me back. But the queen is the egg laying machine. 15 to 1,800 eggs a day. Just, yeah, I, I, with the USDA study, I had to tag and count with grids how many eggs laid. Anywhere between 15 and 1,800 throughout the whole summer. Spring, she spills up to that. In the fall, she starts to cut back. Imagine if a chicken could lay 1,500 eggs a day. You'd want to be a chicken farmer, right? Now, let's go in, what, what happens in a hive? What is the activities? Here on the left, this is a field bee. By the way, the first, first two weeks of a bee's life is in the hive, never goes out. They just clean the hive, polish the cells, feed the young babies, and then the last four weeks of the bee's life, they gather nectar and honey and pollen and bring it back in, and then they die. Their wings wear out. And rather than dying in the hive and causing extra work to be carried out, you know what they do? They go out and die by themselves. And just selfish, selfish, less, not selfish at all. You know, they, they do everything for the good of the hive. And what happens, here's the field bee that's been gathering nectar and pollen. Here's the house bee, hasn't been out of the hive yet. The field bee's got a little drop of nectar that brought back in the honey stomach. The house bee puts their tongues together like two straws and the house bee sucks the nectar out and puts it and stores it in the cell. And that way the field bee can go right back and get more nectar. And all day that happens. It's great teamwork. The house bees and the field bees, it's teamwork at its best. 
You see it in the hive and you see how, how they come together. A house field bee comes in, you see the house bee waiting, sucking the nectar out so the house bee can go right out, or the field bee can go right out and get more nectar. And by the way, isn't she a cutie? Susie. Nice brown eye, look at those big brown eyes, the blonde hair, the sleek body. Isn't she a cutie? I admire the beauty of bees. It's just really fascinating to me. And these are the god bees at the entrance. There's the females. They had a not the males. You'd think it'd be the males. The females are guarding. See the scent gland at the back? They spread the scent to let the bees coming in know this is your hive. They orient themselves by the sun when they go out. But when they get close and you get four or five hives in a row, they get a little confused. But as they spread that pheromone, they know exactly this because they all smell the same in that hive. You know, and, and they zero right into that hive and bring their nectar back, their pollen. And they got, if the bee doesn't smell the right way and doesn't smell like them, guess what they do? They go after, chew at it, takes off. If it doesn't, they'll even sting it and die for the cause. Defending their hive. A bumblebee, I watched a bumblebee, four or five and gang up. A bumblebee tried getting in, just robbed the honey. They yeah, jumped right on, four or five them, and the bumblebee took off pretty quick. And by the way, a mouse, last winter, a mouse got into the hive. When the weather gets cold and the bees are clustered, the mouse got in. Well, apparently on a warm day, the mouse was moving around. And I was scraping my bottom boards last, this past spring. And all of a sudden, I didn't know what. There was all this bee glue, propolis, they call it, all over this big, like a mound. And all of a sudden, then I see the tail. I scraped it off, and there was the face of the mouse. The, you could see the eyes were decayed out and the nose and, and the teeth, it was like this. It died in pain, the bees stung it to death because it invaded the hive. And they knew they couldn't get it out because it was too heavy. You know what they did? They propolized it. You couldn't even smell the decay. They did that to keep that hive smelling good and instead of decaying mouse, which would smell bad. It's amazing how they can do that. A mouse this big, and yet they kept it from smelling. It's like embalming back in the old day. So it wouldn't. And here's, here's a little house bee, two days old, already carrying out a dead larva, cleaning the house, cleaning the hive. And you get, here's a water gathering bee. All creatures need water. So guess what? The bees in the hive and the babies need water. How do they get it? The water gatherers. They go out, bring water back, so the nurse bees can give the young babies water. They bring water back for the house bees that don't fly out to get it. Everybody needs water to survive, and so do the bees. So they're, they're the water gatherers. You see them at your, your bird baths, you see them near a stream, you see them gathering water, bringing it back to the hive. If it gets too hot in the summer, you know what they do? To regulate the temperature, cool down, they bring water back, put droplets all over the frames, and then fan. You know what process that's called. Evaporation. You ever hear evaporation? It cools down the whole hive. And here's the nurse bee, uh, the god bee. This is a close up of the god bee here. Now, here's the nurse bee. See right inside? See the little larva, the white grubs? They feed these honey and pollen chewed up and they add enzymes from the back of their head, and they feed these young babies, so they grow big and strong. And these nurse bees are constantly feeding, because every, every four hours, these larvae, through chemical release, are saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. It must drive these nurse bees nuts. Feed me, feed me. Here's the nurse bees going from cell to cell, trying to feed all the babies. But they're fascinating to watch, these nurse bees. They go up, get the pollen and honey, chew it up, and feeding all these nurse bees every four hours. It, that's a chore in itself. So that's all going on in the hive. And I'm going to skip that one there. But here's the male. Here's the drone. They strut around on the sides of the hive, eat, have fun. And then when they're called upon, and like I say, I, I, I uh, was talking to a group of elderly uh, women's club members. and. Um, 
So I got into about the mating process. The, the queen goes up into the flight and the males all go after trying to be the ones to mate with her. And so what happens is, I said, but that gets into my X-rated talk and you girls are a little too young, so we want to hear that talk. We want to hear that talk. And here's the queen. She's the largest, double the size of a worker bee, and she lays 1,500 eggs a day. She goes, puts her head into each cell, and you can see most beekeepers mark her so they can find her in a hive easy. They mark her and see the quarter of bees around her. They groom her, they feed her, they do everything for her. All she does is lay eggs from January through November. And she's good, once she's made it, she's good for two years. She's got enough sperm to fertilize the eggs and be able to keep that hive regenerated with the population. It's a numbers game because every six weeks they're dying. So guess what? If she didn't lay enough eggs, the hive would dwindle down. And that's the good thing about honeybees. They build big populations and they can, you know, keep warm inside. They can pollinate the crops because sheer numbers, 80,000. And here's the queen putting her head in the cell. My friend took these pictures, by the way, uh, in some great photography, macro lens he had. And here, this is a photo he sold to one of the bee magazines. I took the queen out with my fingers that she had her abdomen into the cell, and guess what? The egg was just coming out of the ovipositor. Now this is magnified. Picture this. Picture this. A egg that is thread. You ever see white thread? That's how thin that egg is. Only one one hundredth of an inch. It's like a rice grain down there. But you can see it with the naked eye. And she lays an egg in every one of these cells and fills them up. And in 21 days, guess what? 1,800 eggs are going to be hatching on that. The 1,800 bees are going to be hatching on that given day out of this hive. 1,800. It's like 1,800 babies hatching. And so that's a great photo. And here's the egg. And in three days, it hatches into a little grub, a little larva. And see how every one of the cells is filled up with an egg? Magnified, of course. But that's another amazing feat in itself. Mathematics, the six-sided is the most best geometric, strongest geometric shape. Six-sided against six-sided. And they, every one of these cells is the same size, six-sided. How they do that is amazing, like mathematicians. Every cell, every one of these cells is six-sided. You can take a look at this after, and they're all the same size, the exact same size. T to do that is a feat in itself to, to me, you know. And of course, in three days, they all hatch out into little babies, and they're ready, feed me, feed me, feed me. And for seven days, that's all they're doing. Feed me, feed me. They grow big and strong with the protein of the pollen. And then in seven days, see how they grow big very quickly. In seven days, they cap it over. They cap it over, and it turns into a pupa and into an adult. And then 21 days later, from when the egg was laid, in 21 days, the most miraculous activity I love to see, this little baby bee starts chewing its way, and it's a 35 to 40 minute process and I've watched the whole thing from the first little puncture right to the birth of a bee. I love that part of this whole process you go in. It's, it's so miraculous. This little bee struggles for 45 minutes chewing its way through the capping and you can see in three parts here look at what its little legs trying to pull its way up because it's so tight in there and the middle one look at the heads out there resting with the little legs right there and then, finally, all sweated up, all wet, and almost out. And I love to, when new beekeepers go out there, and I go into there, uh-oh, and new beekeeper, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, shh, I don't want to do brain damage. I take tweezers, I pull away the capping, and then help with the tweezers, I pull that little baby bee out. And 
stop pulling it out. What's wrong? What's wrong? And all of a sudden I say, it's a girl. <laughs> and you know what the question is? How can you tell? They're thinking about something else. I said, it's a worker bee. They're all girls. And so you see the little, little, little brown eyes looking up at, at the camera and the, the hair wet, just hatched out like a little baby chick out of an egg. But it's a 45 minute struggle. And then I say to the people, I deliver more babies than any obstetrician. That's the cycle they go through, 21 days, every 21 days. When they lay the egg, 21 days later, 1,800 bees are hatching out, but 1,800 are dying. And so they go out to the flowers. Those field bees, from 4.30 in the morning till 9 at night, they're gathering nectar and pollen and bringing it back, not only to feed the young babies, but guess what? They have to eat all winter long to keep heat. They need a lot of honey. You know how much honey they eat in the winter? 80 to 100 pounds of honey. Isn't that amazing? They, to keep that hive warm, feed themselves, feed their babies, 80 to 100, and this is where you as a beekeeper, you need to make sure they've got that much honey to save the bees. Otherwise, it's your fault if they starve. If you take too much honey from them, they're gonna starve, and shame on you as a beekeeper. But there's the pollen, the bright yellow pollen of goldenrod. This is goldenrod pollen because it was goldenrod season. They're bringing it back in their baskets. And this next shot is an amazing shot. In the U.S. Day study I was doing, the chief scientist and I, we took that bee, we took the pollen off of the baskets, weighed the pollen, and we weighed the bee. The pollen weighed just a little more than the bee itself. And yet that bee flew two miles with those sacks of pollen, it'd be like putting a person your weight on your back and jumping off the ground, and this bee flew back. Aerodynamics, it, it just almost, you can't explain it. They lumber in to the hive, boom, they land like a, a bouncing ball and they kind of jump and finally go in the hive. Hard work. That's why they die every six weeks. Their wings wear out. And they store the pollen because here, in January and February and March, when they start laying eggs and raising young again, guess what? There's no pollen out there, no protein for them. So they have to store it. So the next January, there's pollen in the hive. They need about 10 or 12 pounds of pollen. And then they gather that from the fields. Goldenrod, Chinese bamboo, you name it. They're out there right now loading up with pollen. Bring it into the hive for the winter. And there's the nectar. The house bees, see them putting it in? They put it all in the cells here. They fill all the cells up with ne nectar. And you can never tell. It comes in different colors. You know, from very light to almost black to brown. All different flowers. You'll get a chance to taste the different honeys up there. Just wonderful but look at all the different from the different flowers that they get and they cap it over after after they get all the excess water out of it they cap it over see what a nice wax see the frame up here when you see after that's I just took that off I just took that off yesterday that frame of honey all capped over ready to take out and spin out in my honey house and my daughters when they were young they used to Dad, I want to be the taste of God. I did. One would spin, one would uncap, one would put the frames in, and my youngest daughter, Dad, can I be the taster? Because I always had a taster. <laughs> Dad, taste this one. It tastes like apricots. I said, that's from my apricot trees. And it tastes like the fruit. A lot of the honey, they taste like the fruit it comes from. That's why the spring honey there, you'll taste it. It's a fruity taste. That's a lot of the early fruit berries. And the wax, they build it from the honey. They need the honey to build the wax. They ooze wax, wax out of their wax glands, and they build that comb. That's their nest. Honeybees make their comb not out of paper, out of wax. Mind your bees' wax. And they build it in round sheets, six-sided cells. 
Now this girl isn't happy. Look at her eyes. She's not too happy. That's Sarah. Sarah's got propolis on her back legs. She's been signed to go out, gather resins, pine sap, and bring it back, and they convert it into a sticky glue that is like super glue when it hardens. You need a hive tool to break open the frames and get the frames out of the hive to check them. It's like a super glue. It's called propolis. And in Europe, they use it for medicinal qualities. My dad used to give it to me for sore throats. Sore throat would be gone. For poison ivy, we po oozing poison ivy my sister had, he'd put propolis on the next day. Two days later, it was gone. Remember, if you remember calamine lotion, they used to, it hardly worked, never worked. Finally, Dr. O'Connor in our own town, when he saw it work, he used to send all the people that had bad poison ivy that was oozing to my dad, go get some propolis tincture from Mr. Watchell. And they used to come over and, and get propolis tincture. And of course, this next picture, they organize themselves so well. Honey at the top of the frame, they store like a rim of honey right up here. Underneath it, they put pollen, all different colors. They give them a balanced diet. And then all the worker bees, the girl bees. You notice what they think of the boy bees, only a few of them hatching out in the lower corners. And that's how they organize. So nurse bees can go up, get the honey and pollen, and be right next to the babies they're feeding. Isn't that amazing how organized they are? No one, instead of having the pollen way over here, the honey way over there, they know to put it right there where they need it. And once a year, by the way, if everything goes well, like this year, I ended up getting 75 pounds of honey from each of my 131 hives. It was a great year. I got the best honey year in 15 years I've had this year. Was the, it was conditions were right in nature and uh, just perfect. And once a year, bees swarm. They build a queen cell, new queen, and before the new queen hatches out, the old queen takes half of the bees and leaves. The new queen now hatches out, and now the boys come into action. The boys, when she goes out for a mating flight, 15 of them, the drones all mate with her. 15 of them over the course of a week will mate with her, and she's mated for life. But that's the queen cell, and what happens? When that old queen leaves, she takes half of the bees with her, and see, how many of you have seen a swarm? How many, have everybody seen a swarm? They land on a bush, they land on a tree, they land on the front porch. In Somerville this past last year, in August, I went into a kitchen. The family was in the backyard with a swim pool in downtown Somerville, where it's all houses nearby and activity. They were out in the swim pool. My friend Charlie, a beekeeper there in Somerville, first year beekeeper, I got him started. Well, guess what? His hive swarmed out. I didn't know this. Two houses down. So I got a call on the phone. Ken, Ken, can you come out here, please? Can you come out here? I says, what's wrong, Charlie? Just come out here, please. I threw down a mass pike. I thought he was dying or something. You know, the guy, I went out there. I said, what's wrong, Charlie? Come on over. We went over two houses over. Right, every, there's a crowd gathered, about 15 people, looking at the front door of this house with a screen door. Right away, I knew what was going on. The people all watching, and so she tells me, we came in, mom and the younger one came in, because the door, they left it open. She got into the kitchen. There on the light fixture, a swarm of 25,000 bees with bees that were going in and out. What she did, shut the screen door immediately. Well, guess what? All those bees that were gathering nectar and pollen were trying to get to their queen and to their nest. And so all of a sudden, I knew the picture right away. I, I went in. I opened the door. Everybody said, they're not stinging you. They're all over. Or swooling around, they're not stinging you. So I figured I'd play it up a little. I said, no, no, I didn't want to give them the wrong impression. I said, they're not stinging at all. And I went in. She says, Mom says, how long is it going to take you to get it out? I said, I'll be back at 8.30 tonight. 8.30? We can't use our house? I said, you can use the, the living room. You can use the bedrooms. Just don't go in the kitchen. Leave the screen door open. They might even leave in between. I get there at 8.30 at night. 
Guess what? The swarm's still there. I thought it might leave because swarms sometimes settle and they leave. But it didn't, so I had my ladder, a white bucket, and all of a sudden, I sprayed them with sugar syrup, and then with my bare hands, I got up there, plop, right in the bucket, I put the cover onto the white five-gallon bucket, I said, thanks for the swarm. Mom says, that's all there is to it? I says, that's it, it's simple. I said, what you see being done here, do not try at home, this is being done by a trained professional. Oh, I'd never try that. And, and she said, but you know what, this year, the two boys, Charlie had the two boys coming over with dad looking at the bee, beehive and the bees last year, guess what they did? This year they got a beehive with the two boys into it. They're into it big time. Mom isn't, but dad and two boys love it. They go over with Charlie and he helps them out. And, and it's a great story because what could have turned disaster, Charlie says, thank you, Ken. He said, I thought I was in major trouble. I said, Charlie, it's simple. Beekeeping simple. So anyway, swarms, and a little bit here, I'm almost done, and the yellow jacket, I'm gonna skip that. Yellow jackets, don't confuse them, there's loads of them this year. Yeah, everybody experience the yellow jackets, those yellow, bright yellow, black, they no hair on them, one wing on each side. They're in giant numbers this year, so uh, don't confuse and blame the honeybee, because the honeybees are docile, yellow jackets more aggressive. That's what the difference is. That's my dad with the Polish color hives that he insisted on, and I'm all Polish. I'm, uh, I speak fluent Polish and um, come from Poland. Uh, my dad comes from Poland, and, and so uh, I'm first generation here in America, but sixth generation beekeeper, which I'm proud of. And here you can see me at a meeting. I'm here, I'm the guy with the shorts right here and the green army cutoffs from my army days. And I'm, I'm talking to the session of 300 showed up at my house for the bee meeting. My, wa my wife and my mom, uh, my mom at that point, uh, that was last year. I used to have uh, dark blonde hair, now I'm light blonde. Oh, wait a minute, that's 1983. But anyway, we prepared for 100. My mom had to, uh, wife had to go out and get food for 300. And strawberry shortcake, uh, meatballs, spaghetti, and and salad, so what a turnout we had. 300 beekeepers show up at my house for a meeting. So it's fun by going to meetings, and, and uh, if you put the lights on, go to meetings, you, you meet other beekeepers, and you get into the hobby, and how do you start? It'll take about five more minutes to tell you how to start beekeeping. You get yourself a box of bees, a cage. In here, 10,000 bees hanging in a big clump, and inside here, a queen hanging down. You gotta open up, take the wooden flap off, and in a second take the queen out, put the wooden flap back, and then you stick the queen into the hive. Like this, you hang it down in between the frames, and then all of a sudden, you never forget this the rest of your life. I did it when I was five years old. I said, Dad, I don't know if I can do it. You can do it. That strong military, you can do it. it. Made me think I can do anything in the world. And so I went out with a new bee couple of beekeepers, Margie and Jeff. They started this year. So I followed them. I, we went and picked up the bees with them down next town over from me. And all of a sudden, Margie's got the bees. And I could see, because on the outside, there's like 30, 40 bees as stragglers. They attach themselves on the outside. So here's Margie, has got the package like this going to the, going to the car. <laughs> you know, I said, Margie, they won't sting you, don't worry. And I says, so when we got there, I says, okay, who wants to uh, uh, shake the package of bees? They took the queen out, put her in, and then shake the package of bees. Jeff says, Margie, why don't you do it? I'll hold the dog, make sure you don't get stung. I said, Jeff. He says, she said, well, she really wants the beekeeping. Uh, so Jeff walked away, held the dog. Margie said, I'll do it. So anyway, I said, Margie, you'll never forget this the rest of your life. Just like I did when I was age five. So she had it there, the hive was ready, the queen was in. She took the flap off and in an instant started shaking the bees like this for about four or five minutes. Ken, how's that? I said, there's a hundred more bees up in that corner. Uh, how's that? After two more minutes. I said, there's two more up in that corner. 
How, how's that? I said, go ahead, you can stop. I could have stopped it two, three minutes ago, but uh, she says, you're all right. My heart's beating 210. She says, I'll never forget this. I said, Jeff, next year it's your turn. Uh, so that's how you'd get started. Then once a week, you'd go into the beehive with your hive tool and your bee veil, and you'd see if the queen's laying eggs yet. So you'd see if the bees are healthy. You'd look to make sure that they got enough food. You'd feed them at the beginning because there's not that many bees. And throughout the whole summer, once a week, you and the bees make a bonding. And it's a great, great hobby. When you're stressed and go out to your beehive, you know, sometime I'm out there in the Berkshires looking down the side of a mountain, me and the bees only, there's the stream down below, or I was out in Truro on the, on the sand dunes, the hive was in a tent to keep the sand from blowing in, looking at the waves crashing in the Atlantic, just me and the bees, so peaceful. You know, or even in Boston on a 16th floor with a six foot by four foot overhang looking down, the bees are flying down instead of up to get to the trees. But it's so soothing and relaxing no matter where you are as the hobby of beekeeping. And then the end of the season, guess what? Guess what? You go and see if you got extra honey to take out. That's every beekeeper, by the way, this is a smoker. You give them a little smoke to calm them down. Millions of years of forest fires, bees knew they had to leave. So they go gorge themselves with honey. In the meantime, if you see you're not hurting them, guess what? They let you work just like this. You saw the poster out there with thousands of bees flying around me. They don't hurt you. And so in the fall, you go in, do I have extra honey? And all of a sudden, you look and you pull out this beautiful frame of honey all capped over and underneath there the most beautiful taste the honey this is the light one that's back here this is all light honey and the bees have done this they added enzymes to the honey extra water was evaporated and then they capped it over and so you spin out as a family I just went to attorney Jim Blodgett. She had some of the judges and some of the district attorneys down there in Worcester. They called it an extracting party. We had honey wine. We were tasting. We tasted the honey as it came out. And, and we had a great time this past Saturday in, in down there in Worcester. But, you know, how beautiful. Take a look at this after and see the beauty of this wax close up. I'll leave it out here. And, and so you spin it out when my daughters. I used to love the hobby. They'd be spinning, they'd be tasting, and one of them now still has a beehive. But you can see the wax, the honey you get to taste, and then with the wax that you uncap, you use a knife, you uncap it and spin it out. Centrifugal force throws it out, and then you got the wax. You can make beautiful candles. My daughter is a skilled artist, kind of, and she made this beautiful candle we molded, and then she did the artistic work on it, and we used to give one to our friends. We'd put a basket together, light honey, dark honey, a candle like this, and like I say, you can make blocks of beeswax, you know, just plain beeswax for different purposes. You can make, for different holidays, different dye and make beautiful rolled candles. For St. Patrick's Day, we had two couples over, we gave them candles that were green. For Christmas, we give all our friends in that basket red and green candles, a pair of each, and then some beautiful molded candles that we, we give them. And so you can make all kind of uh, candles. I took this, this was last year. My wife, I was looking around, I was melting the wax, looking for a container, what to make a candle out of. There I saw my wife's guppy bowl on the television. She was gone. I took the guppy out, put it into a honey jar, and put it on a TV. Honest to God. And, and my wife didn't even notice for three days. Finally, I came out with this candle, and I says, look, Deb. She looks on TV. You took my guppy bowl. I said, it's in the honey jar. They, it likes it. It's sweet in there. And she said, you're going to buy? I said, she said, how are you going to get it out? I said, with a hammer. 
Oh, well, sure, you want to buy me another one? I said, yeah, yeah, don't worry. And so you can make beautiful, this 20 hours of burning, such a beautiful scent for dinner, you know, time. So candles, then we make hand cream. I want you to try this stuff. Beeswax hand cream, just wonderful moisturizer. Lip balm. Lip balm out of beeswax, honey and beeswax. Did you try this? I better not. <laughs> and, and soap. Smell this after. This is the soap I use. She, I sell her the wax. She makes this soap for me, uh, Sue Ingle. And uh, just wonderful, wonderful honey and beeswax soap. Natural products at their best. So all from the honeybee. And then, you know, you can cook with honey. This recipe book, Worcester County put out, it was dedicated to my dad and I for 100 years of beekeeping between us. And in here, some of my grandmother's, great-grandmother's recipes, uh, my wife's recipe, how to cook with honey, everything about cooking with honey. And we have, like, we have dinners where my wife will make the dinner. I'll do dessert, cooking with honey. So this past weekend, we had two couples over. She made chick chicken glazed with honey and pistachio honey apricot stuffing. Does that sound good? And... Then we had sweet potatoes glazed with honey and carrots with a semi-glaze and with honey. And I made the dessert. I soaked the strawberries with this light, light honey all day and put it in the refrigerator and let it soak up the honey. Strawberries and honey is like bread and butter. I drizzled it with the light honey, soaked the strawberries. When they came, my turn for dessert. Everybody's raving about my wife's chicken and all the stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, the two couples, and I brought out the strawberries. I put the whipped cream, fresh whipped cream on. Then I took some of this nice, dark, rich honey, drizzled it all over the cream. And then I took fresh trapped maple pollen from the maple trees. I sprinkled it all over. And when all of them bit into it, oh, my God, what a plethora of taste. How'd you make this? I said, that's my secret recipe. <laughs> and But you can cook with honey. It's amazing. You know, here's a wonderful raspberry honey jam. Oh, the honey you can taste with the raspberries. It's, you know, honey, apple honey butter. You get, you know, all, you can, in the barbecue sauce, put honey. When you put on chicken, just wonderful. Cooking with honey. And the newest hobby is making mead. You know, here we've got a peach, this is my favorite, peach honey mead. It's peaches and honey, and oh, what a, with, with the strawberry shortcake, we gave it to the guest. Shark, little thing of peach honey mead with the strawberry shortcake they had. Oh, just wonderful. And here's, here's a pomegranate honey mead that a friend of mine just tried and made. Oh, that's second best to the peach. And then you had, this is a nice dessert mead. And even dry meads, were you tipping on this? I thought that was full. No? Oh, well, maybe somebody else. Well, I was back there. But anyway, honey bear. They're brewing, water breweries are buying honey now for me for Brewing, honey bear, yeah, just wonderful. And like I say, you can trap the pollen, which is high protein, just don't take too much. My friend Bob, because I go out with my track, college track runners, and we go out, eat, want to stay together as a group. We've been, since I ran college track, we're a close-knit group. All 9.30, oh, I'm wiped, I'm gonna go ahead. I said, guys, what's wrong? It's only 9.30, I'm ready to party. And what, what do you do? I says, I says, well, I take every day honey on my pancakes or my French toast and put pollen on. So I gave my friend Bob, can I have some pollen? So I gave him some pollen, he, two jars. He took two heaping tablespoons. <laughs> well, that night he calls me up at 2 o'clock in the morning. He said, Ken, what's in there? So he says, I took two tablespoons. I, I, I'm like this. I'm white. I can't sleep. And I says, you took too much. How much you take? 
two tablespoons. Oh my God, all you take is a half a teaspoon. It's high protein. You're going to be careful. You don't want to overdo it. With, uh, with, but it's wonderful. I like the maple. I trapped the maple with this pollen trap. And uh, so the hobby is widespread. It's got a lot to offer. The kids can make this. You can make the hand cream, the lip balm. You can have, you know, the wipes you don't want the bees to like. Then make, making all kind of products. You know, it's a great, great hobby. It's the fastest growing hobby out there right now. And to end it kind of here, what can you do to help? Well, you can, first of all, look under pollinated friendly plants and plant, instead of planting regular flowers that aren't good for the bees, pollinated friendly that they get pollen and nectar from. You can leave your meadows and fields, so the goldenrod, the milkweed, the Joe pie weed all grows up so the bees have foraging. Instead of cutting it down and they have no foraging. You can stop beekeeping, go to a bee school, stop beekeeping, that's a helpful thing. And help put more bees out for pollination purposes. And you can also, you get a swarm, find out, don't have it exterminated. Save it, call a beekeeper, they'll be more than happy. I love swarms. I love to go after swarms. They build faster than a regular package of bees. So you can do stuff. And like I said, I'll finish you with this story by Stash Preklevich, a Polish beekeeper down in uh, Blackstone, Mass. Stash, Polish for Stanley. He knew my grandfather, my father. Five years ago now, Stash was coming near the end, 95 years old. He loved his bees. He started when he was five like me. He had to go in a nursing home. His wife and daughter said, Stash, you got it. He wouldn't go without his bees. They called me up and said, Ken, what can we do? I went to the nursing home. They wouldn't allow it because of liability. So I went to the farmer across the street. And I said, can we put a beehive? And I told him the situation. He said, oh, sure. He said, bring them out anytime you want. I went down to Blackstone. I said, Stash, guess what? We can take your beehive. That smile from ear to ear of his that I always remembered. And he gradually went. He said, you're going to take me out to the beehive? I said, absolutely, as often as I can. Once a week, every other week, I'd go. He saw me coming down the hallway. He got into his wheelchair, ready to go, that big smile. He knew he was going out to his behave. I took him through the fields, all quads. He'd be bouncing like this, and, and all the way out, the beehive was down in the lower corner, and you know what? I could see the love, the look. He just stared. We got there, he wanted to get out of his wheelchair and picked up the boxes. I said, no, no, Stash. Here, find the queen. You know, find the queen. You can see the queen's in here. Uh, she's marked red there, so that's the queen. He'd, he'd find the queen on frame. Ken, here she is. Oh, look here, the nurse's bees are feeding the young in this frame. And you could see the love for half hour would go by, I said, Stash, we gotta go. He says, 15 more minutes, please, Ken. I said, Stash, 15 more minutes. And then we wrapped it up, we take them back. You're gonna be back next week to take me? I said, we will, Stash, if I can. One week I didn't, he called me, Ken, can you, you're gonna be coming this week? I said, Stash, I can't, you can't. I could see the dejection in his voice. It went on for a year and a half, make a long story short. Stash, last time I was out there, we got out there, I could see he's not the same. We got out there and he said, can we talk, Ken? I said, Stash, I've known you all my life as a little boy. I said, whatever you want. He said, Ken, I don't have much longer in this world. Would you take my hive and keep it alive, please? Maybe someday I'll be joined back up with my hive. And he said to me, he said, please keep twice or three times. Please keep it alive. Don't let it die. I said, it's a big promise, Stash, in today's world. I said, I'll do my best. Well, guess what? You know, I put it. He passed away two days later. He knew. He passed away. I went to his wake, his funeral. He wrote the most beautiful letter in Polish. Dear Ken, only you would have understood what bees mean to me because you had the same experience in life. He says, someday I think I might be reunited with my bees. And so he passed away. And I put it in South Grafton. It was hive number six, the big S on it. This past fall, I was taking out the honey, and a former 
NFL player, Mike Reed, with the Colts, 6'9 and 275. He can carry three boxes of honey at once. I carry one. But he comes out, he's learning beekeeping from me. And he said, Ken, what's that S there? I said, Mike, you probably won't understand. This is a beekeeper that had a beehive for life. He just passed away. And I said to him, I said, that big S stands for Stash, Stash Praklovich. He's up there looking over me. He said, this is five years now that hive is still alive. So I said, some do it for a short time, get into it. One year, two years, and they're out of it, like any hobby. Some like me, it's a lifetime of joy, and they stay with it for life. So I said, Mike, I said, just that'll suffice. He said, well, I can understand that, you know? And uh, so Stash loved his bees, and I told my wife, my ashes are going scattered in front of my beehives. I, I felt it's a love affair between me and the bees. Sometimes she gets jealous because I spend so much time with the bees. But anyway, with that note, thank you for listening. I'm not a great speaker, but I know my stuff. And, and hopefully uh, you've got something a little bit. I'm happy to answer questions here for you. And I want you to get to taste some honey so that you'll know what different, what, and never say what's honey, never say honey is honey is honey. Not the processed stuff that you get in the Walmarts or wherever. You want to get from a local that's native, like, like honey that's not processed. But the spring honey, the fall honey, is on special at all the libraries I've gone to. Marked at $8, you'll find most local honeys, it's $11 a pound. So at the libraries, I did this, all libraries, I brought spring and fall, taste them both, and if you like it, you can buy one uh, there and uh, taste all the other honeys from around the world and the country. Any questions? I, yeah, feel free to take some hand, try some hand cream, um, take some uh, lip balm if you like, smell the soap, taste, you know, uh, over here, uh, I was going to say, but uh, we can't, it's public domain, so can't have people trying to mead. So uh, anyway, any questions? How often do you have to clean the beehive? Well, you, you, in the spring and the fall, you clean it. Where you go into the hive and do a cleaning of it, scrape things down. It's about 30 minutes a week you have to go and check for a queen, do all the things that you need to do. Check for a queen, make sure she's laid, make sure you don't have any sicknesses in the beehive, or you, then you got to do something. It's a maintenance thing, about 30 minutes a week per hive. Not much. It's, it's a fun hobby. You, and I tell people, appreciate it. Go into your hives. Don't let people say, oh, you shouldn't go in often. I go in once a week, and I got a whole bunch of them. And I do swarm prevention, that's why I get honey. If you let them swarm, there goes your honey crop, because you lose half your bees. So be a be good beekeeper, and not a bee haver, as we call it. You're welcome. OK, with that. What happens if there's a uh, sickness? Follow, yeah, yeah, well, there's different, what, depending what what it is, you diagnose it or have the bee inspector diagnose it, and then you can treat for a lot of them. One of them, you have to get rid of it. Yeah, you have to destroy it. In one case, one disease that's really a uh, bad infectious disease because it spreads like wildfire. Yeah, you don't want the others to get it right. Yeah. All right, go ahead and try the honey.